All right, welcome back. This is Harlan Simon again. The segment I am about to present to you will demonstrate how to do plunging. Plunging involves this diabolical tool. It's a tungsten pick, and this time it really is tungsten. There was an earlier segment where I wasn't quite sure I used a steel pick for raking. Um, it's doable with a steel pick, just as you have to keep it cool by dipping it in water and the glass tends to stick to steel. Whereas tungsten, it's harder to get the glass to stick to, to it, so it's a better uh, tool of choice for plunging. And in this plunging technique, I'm going to poke in holes in my bead and then fill them with a clear layer to create entrap entrapped bubbles. So it's basically um, air bubble entrapment. And it's very pretty because the bubbles are uh, sort of shimmery and shiny and silvery um, and very intriguing and, um, and quite beautiful. So... That's my tungsten pick. The only thing to know about tungsten, though, is it's very brittle, and they're ex somewhat expensive, you know, $5 or $3 for this little piece of metal, uh, available also at a welding store or through a bead supply uh, company. Um, so you want to, because of its brittleness, though, avoid dropping it on hard surfaces because they will break. So let us begin. I'm going to choose my, um, my bead base which is going to be um, a light green. I'm going to put a thin layer of light green onto the mandrel. Of course, I'm using a pre-coated mandrel where the bead release has already dried. And if you're tuning in late, you haven't seen other segments, there is a segment on mandrel dipping in this series where I talk about the different bead releases and the process of dipping the mandrel, which is really simple. So I've got a gather of this light emerald, and I just sort of apply it in the typical donut fashion. For those of you watching a lot of these segments, you'll notice that I do a lot of donut beads, and that's because it is a very basic sort of elemental shape relatively fast and very, very good for both jewelry and for demonstration purposes. So I've got a layer of emerald transparent. Now I heat it in. Flame is a little hot, so I'm going to tone it, tune it down. Because it's a transparent, I want to kind of keep it clean. I want a fairly uh, lean, or ox not oxidizing, but neutral certainly not a reducing or highly propane, propanated environment. I want fairly clean. And I let that bead sort of slump down onto itself, keep rotating, keep thinking good thoughts. Smooth and steady wins the race. Slow and steady wins the race. And you, you know, you can also, just to get familiar with the use of the marver, you can do that again sort of making a really pretty sort of barrel bead, and that would be a beautiful bead just in and of itself. But wait, there's more, because this is a plunge bead, an air entrapment bead, so we're going to take this further. I'm going to put a layer of clear onto that layer of green for secret reasons. The, the bead rod is thermal shocking all over the place, but because I'm in the downward away from me angle it didn't hit me it didn't end up in my sh on my shirt or in my lap little secret way if you don't have an extra hand to clean that end of glass off with a tweezer is you can also just sort of drape on to your mandrel a little bit one wrap or two of the clear and that cleans the scummy part off because it's transparent to transparent, which is the base that we had, that light green, I want to kind of get that transparent base pretty hot so there's no air bubble layer in between these two transparents. So there's no kind of film or scuzz or scum layer. There often is if you don't heat your base glass well enough. And what this clear is doing, a little trick of the trade, is that it's creating some visual distance so that it will look as if these the ultimate plunge plunge areas that I'll do shortly will look like they're floating 
and that's always good. And it just sort of magically suspended there. And that's the beauty of glass. Besides the sort of obvious optical or magnifier effects, you also have um, the ability to create layers and depth in three dimension. So what I've done is now I've created a transparent green underbase, and then the middle layer, which is clear now, will be sort of like a like an airspace almost. It'll be like a a zone in which my further outer designs will hover. So nice and steady, nice and smooth, a great little toroid or torus shape. Bead is now firm. Time to put down white or maybe ivory. Ivory would be really nice. Having a short color selection break where I reached down into my glass library and found a color that I think will be good for my cell development over the ivory. So I'm going to do um, six cells, one, and 180 degrees opposite, two, three, four, five, six. The mass of the original lay down is pretty consistent, so it doesn't need much doctoring. And I can go really fast now because these um, that cold that bead is very cold, so it's not going to fling around anything like that. So that was my ivory. Slow down the spin. You go really fast at this point, you sort of start elongating the design, like the rings of Saturn. The, the equatorial bead mass would start to rise up. I don't want that. I like that squat look. If I want, I can cool it a little with a marver and make it squat a little bit. I haven't really shown much use of the Osaban marver, but this is, this would be it, and you just sort of use the natural curve. So it's, it's really a, a natural tool, since you're trying to achieve roundedness in the bead, it's a very natural tool to use a rounded depression. A bead that was, a tool that was invented by Arrow Springs in con collaboration with Kim Osaban. A lot of these tools, like the Smirchich tailstock, they are named after, or the stump master, the stump shaper, and they're named after the bead makers who pioneered their design and use. I do not have a tool named after me yet. Oh well. Anyways, here we go. So we've got nice ivory cells. And uh, I've chosen this kind of rich topaz. I'm going to put right over the ivory. And that's going to give me a kind of tinted, ambery color. It's probably a good thing to clean the end of the tip of the glass because it was, it was from a cracked straight edge. And it gets kind of scummy. So clean it off with a tweezer. It kind of requires a little ambidexterity. And now dot on. One, two, three, three. Notice how I do that sort of Hershey's kiss swirl away. 
That's a good way to break away, like that. You can wait a second. If you wait a little longer, it leaves behind a, a greater quantity of, like, a glass kiss. And if you pull away quicker, that means that less glass will be left behind. You can focus the heat on each dot as you wish. This is a lot like clear casing with dots, but here we're using a transparent instead of clear. Melt it in, let it settle down. My advice is to not use the marver right away. Let the bead sort of set up. If you want to, you know, accelerate things, things through the use of a tool, let the bead set up, and maybe reflash it. Because if you go to a marver too quickly, it's really easy to accentuate distortion. Whereas if you wait a second, the bead is sort of firmer. And that would be pretty just as it is. But that's not what's going to happen. We're going to keep going. And what we're going to do next is take this transparent red. If you look at this cane of glass, you see the end is red, cherry red, whereas the cane itself, the body of it, is for the most part sort of an amber topaz. This is what we would call a striking color. There are not a lot of striking colors in the Moretti or Ephetre. Italian soft glass palette, but there are a few, and this is one of them. So it creates a beautiful crimson if you go further into the heat, and that's what we'll do. We'll put a little dot of the crimson at the center of each of these, the center of each of these um, cells. And I'll cross hands this way so the camera can see what I'm doing. From experience, I know that this red is very rich. So I will not put much, because it will obscure the transparency and translucence of the cell if I do so. So just a dabble do ya. Now spin that on. You can heat up pretty rapidly. Slow down so the camera can see what's going on. Fairly complex bead is taking shape. Again, we started with a green layer at the core, a transparent, clear, intermediate layer, vanilla or ivory reflective screen for dots, six of them, then uh, sort of a medium topaz as a background tint. And you'll notice that the transparent red, the striking red, has completely disappeared. So all you really see is topaz. But that's what happens with striking colors. They have to be flashed back in the flame and voila, the color comes out. 